Book 6, 53 B.C. Suppression of further revolts. I had many reasons, however, for expecting another more serious outbreak of violence in Gaul, and I therefore instructed three of my generals, Marcus Salanus, Gaius Antistius Reginus, and Titus Sextius, to raise fresh troops. At the same time, I sent a message to Pompey, who was now proconsul, but for political reasons was staying near Rome while retaining his military command. I requested him to mobilize the recruits whom he had sworn in in northern Italy when he was consul, and to send them into Gaul to join my army. In my view, it was very important, for the future as well as for the present, that the Gauls should realize that in Italy we had such reserves of manpower that if we did suffer any misadventure in war, we could in a very short time not only make good our losses, but take the field with larger forces than before. Pompey, acting like a patriot and like a friend, did as I asked. The new troops were quickly raised by my own staff officers, and before the end of the winter three new legions, twice the number of cohorts lost by Sabinus, had been formed and had been brought to Gaul. The size of these reinforcements and the speed with which they had been assembled were indications of the efficiency of Roman organization and the strength of Roman resources. After the death of Indutio Marus, the Treveri conferred the supreme command on members of his family, who continued to intrigue with the nearest German tribes, promising to pay them for their help. They failed to make any impression on their immediate neighbors, and went on to approach the more remote tribes, some of whom accepted their proposals. Oaths were exchanged, and hostages given as guarantees for the payment of the promised subsidies. They also invited Ambiorix to join with them in a league of friendship. I received reports of what was going on, and could see that in every direction preparations were being made for war. The Nervi, Aduatuki, and Manapi were in arms, and had been joined by all the German tribes on the left bank of the Rhine. The Senanis had failed to appear at my command, and were engaged in intrigues with the Carnutes and other neighboring tribes. The Treveri were continually sending deputations to the Germans across the Rhine. It seemed to me, therefore, that I must make plans for opening the campaign earlier in the year than usual. So, before the end of the winter, I concentrated the four nearest legions and marched into the country of the Nervi. We took them by surprise, and before they could either assemble or escape, we had captured great numbers of cattle and of prisoners. These were given as booty to the troops. The fields were then laid waste. The tribe was compelled to offer its surrender and to deliver hostages. With this business quickly settled, I led the legions back again to their winter camps. At the beginning of spring I summoned the usual Gallic council. All tribes sent representatives, except the Sinones, the Carnutes, and the Treveri. I regarded this failure of theirs to attend as the first step in the direction of armed rebellion, and wishing to give the impression that everything else was of secondary importance, I adjourned the council, and in a proclamation made from military headquarters, required them to reassemble at Paris. The Parisi shared a frontier with the Sinones, and in the previous generation had been united with them in one state but it was not thought that they had anything to do with the present intrigues. On the same day as the proclamation was made, I started out with the legions against the Senones, and after a series of forced marches, we crossed their frontier. When Akko, the leader of the conspiracy, heard that we were on our way, he ordered the whole population to retire to their strongholds. This they attempted to do, but before they could carry out the operation— News came that we were actually among them. There was nothing that they could do except give up their original plan and send a deputation to me to ask for my forgiveness. They made this approach to me through the Aidui, who had long exercised a kind of protectorate over them, and at the instance of the Aidui I gladly pardoned them and accepted their excuses. 
This was because I had a war on hand, and summer was the time for fighting rather than for holding judicial investigations. However, I ordered them to deliver one hundred hostages, whom I gave to the Ijue to look after. While I was still here, the Carnutes also sent a deputation and delivered hostages. The deputation was sponsored by the Raimi, whose dependents they were, and I gave them the same reply as I had given to the Sunonis. I then completed the business of the Gallic Council and instructed the various states to send me contingents of cavalry. Now that peace had been restored to this part of Gaul, I put my whole heart and soul into the war to be fought against the Treveri and Ambiorix. I told Carverinus to accompany me to the cavalry of the Senones, as I did not want any trouble caused in his tribe by his bad temper and the unpopularity which he had incurred. Once this was settled, I began to imagine what were the courses that Ambiorix might possibly take, having already ruled out the supposition that he would venture on fighting a pitched battle. The Monopi were close neighbors of the Iburones. They were protected by a continuous line of marshes and forests, and they were the only people in Gaul who had never sent deputies to me to ask for peace. I knew that Ambiorix had formed ties of hospitality with the Monopi, and I had also been informed that, by means of the Treveri, he had formed an alliance with the Germans. It seemed to me best to deprive him of these supports before making a direct attack on him. Otherwise he might in desperation be forced to go into hiding among the Monopi, or else join the Germans beyond the Rhine. With this plan in mind, I sent the baggage of the whole army to Labienus in the country of the Treveri, and ordered two legions to set out there, too. I myself marched against the Monopi with five legions, unencumbered by equipment. The enemy made no attempt to get an army together. Relying on the protection that their country afforded, they all fled into the forests and marshes, taking their property with them. I divided our forces into three, taking one division myself and entrusting the command of the other two to the general Gaius Fabius and the quaestor Marcus Crassus. Bridges were quickly constructed, and the three columns moved forward, burning the villages and farm buildings, carrying off great numbers of cattle, and taking many prisoners. The result was that the Monopi were forced to send a deputation to me to beg for peace. I accepted hostages from them, but told them that I should regard them as enemies if they allowed Ambiorix or any of his agents to enter their country. When this business was settled, I left behind Comius the Atribation with a detachment of cavalry to keep an eye on the Monopi and set out myself against the Treveri. While all this was going on, the Treveri had got together a very large army of infantry and cavalry, and were preparing to make an attack on Labienus and the one legion which had been spending the winter in their country. They had already got within two days' march of his camp when they heard of the arrival of the other two legions which I had sent. So they pitched camp about fifteen miles away, and decided to wait there for their German allies. Labienus realized what their intentions were, but hoped that they might prove reckless enough to give him a chance of fighting. So, leaving five cohorts to guard the baggage, he set out against the enemy with a force of twenty-five cohorts and a large body of cavalry. He entrenched a camp about a mile away from them. There was a steep-banked river, very difficult to cross, between him and the enemy. Labienus had no intention of crossing it himself, and did not believe that the enemy would do so either. And with each day that passed, the chances of the arrival of enemy reinforcements increased. Labienus therefore deliberately said in the presence of a number of the men that since the Germans were said to be approaching, he was not going to risk the safety of himself and the army, and would strike camp at dawn on the following day. It was natural that, out of the large number of Gallic horsemen with Labienus, some should be on the side of the Gauls. Consequently, 
These remarks of his were quickly reported to the enemy. During the night, Labienus called a council of officers and senior centurions and explained his plan. In order to make the enemy still more likely to believe that he was frightened, he gave orders that camp should be struck with much more shouting and general disturbance than is usual in a Roman army. In this way, he made it look as though he was running away rather than withdrawing. All this, too, since the camps were so close together, was reported to the enemy by their scouts before dawn. The Gauls now began to excite each other to action. Why, they asked, should they let the plunder, which they had hoped for, slip through their hands? The Romans were already terrified, and it would be a long business to wait for the Germans. Moreover, it would be a disgraceful thing, considering the size of their army, to shrink from attacking such a small enemy force, particularly as it was already in full retreat and hampered by its baggage. So, almost before our rear guard had got clear of the fortifications of the camp, the Gauls came boldly across the river to fight us on ground that was very unfavorable to themselves. This was just what Labienus had expected. So as to draw the whole lot of them across the river, he continued to go quietly ahead, keeping up the pretense that he was marching away. Soon he sent the baggage a little forward, and had it all collected on some higher ground. And then, turning to his men, he said, Soldiers, here is the chance that you wanted. You have the enemy in your grasp fighting in a bad position and on difficult ground. I want you to show under my command the same qualities as you have often shown under the commander-in-chief. Imagine that he is here, and that he is watching you with his own eyes. With these words he ordered the army to face about and form into line of battle. Sending a few squadrons of cavalry to guard the baggage, he stationed the rest on the two flanks. Our men quickly raised a shout and discharged their javelins. The enemy, who had imagined that we were in flight, now most unexpectedly saw us bearing down on them in attack formation. They could not even stand up to the first charge, but as soon as the ranks met, were routed and hurried to gain the shelter of the nearest woods. Labienus followed them up with his cavalry, killed a great number of them and took many prisoners. Within a few days he received the submission of the state, for the Germans, who were coming to the help of the Gauls, went home again when they heard that the Treveri had been defeated, and the relatives of Indutio Marus, who had been responsible for the revolt, fled from the country and went back with the Germans. Singeterix, who, as already mentioned, had been loyal to us from the beginning, was given the supreme civil and military power over his tribe. After marching from the country of the Monopi into that of the Treveri, I decided to cross the Rhine for two reasons. First, because the Germans had sent reinforcements to the Treveri for use against us. Second, because I wanted to prevent Ambiorix from escaping to Germany. Once the decision had been made, I set about having a bridge built a little above the place where we had crossed before. The principles of construction were now well known, and the men worked so well that the bridge was completed in a few days. I left a strong garrison to hold the bridgehead in the country of the Treveri, in case there might be any sudden rising on their part, and led the rest of the army and the cavalry across the river. The Ubii, who had already produced hostages and offered submission, sent a deputation to me to clear themselves of any suspicions I might entertain, and to assure me that they had not broken faith with me, and had not sent any troops at all from their state to help the Treveri. They earnestly begged me to spare them, and not, out of a general hatred of all Germans, to allow the innocent to suffer with the guilty." and they promised to give me more hostages if I wanted them. From inquiries, I discovered that the troops sent had come from the Suebi. 
So I accepted the UBE's explanations and began to collect information about possible lines of advance into the country where the Suebi lived. In a few days' time, I was informed by the UBE that the Suebi were concentrating all their forces into one area and were sending messages out to all their subject tribes, telling them to send contingents of infantry and cavalry. As soon as I got this information, I made arrangements to secure our grain supply and chose a good position for a camp. I ordered the UBE to bring in all their cattle and movable property from the fields into their strongholds, hoping that lack of provisions might induce the ignorant and half-civilized Suebi to fight on ground where conditions would be against them. I also told the UBE to send frequent patrols into the country of the Suebi to find out what they were doing. My instructions were carried out, and, after a few days, the UBE came back to report that as soon as the Suebi had received fuller accounts of the Roman army, they had all retired, with the whole of their force and all the allied contingents, to the most remote parts of their country, where there was an enormous forest called Bacchanis, which stretched far into the interior, and formed a natural barrier between the Suebi and the Cheruski, and prevented either tribe from invading and ravaging the territory of the other. It was on the edge of this forest, so the Ubi informed me, that the Suebi had decided to await our arrival. Customs and Characteristics of the Gauls and Germans at this point, it may not be out of place to give something of an account of the customs of the Gauls and Germans, and of the differences between these two races. In Gaul, one finds that every tribe, every clan, every subdivision of a clan, indeed practically every individual household, is divided into rival factions. The leaders of these factions are men who enjoy a particular prestige among their followers, who are prepared to give them supreme authority in judging and deciding any question whatever which comes up for discussion. This is a time-honored custom of theirs, and its object seems to have been to provide protection for every man of the common people against those who are stronger than he is. For none of these leaders will allow his own followers to be oppressed or cheated. Otherwise he would lose all authority over them. The same principle applies to Gaul as a whole. All the tribes fall into two separate groups. When I first came to Gaul, the leaders of one of these groups were the Aedui, and of the other the Sequani. The Aedui had from ancient times been the most powerful state of all, and had numbers of other states dependent on them. Thus the Sequani, considered a power by themselves, were the weaker of the two. However, the Sequani had made an alliance with Ariovistus and his Germans, and by promising much and sacrificing much, had brought them in on their side. Several battles were fought in which the Aedui were defeated, and their nobility wiped out. In this way, the Sequani had become the predominant power. They had taken over a number of states that used to be dependent on the Aedui, they kept as hostages the children of the leading men of the Aedui, and had compelled the Aeduan government to swear an oath that they would never plot against their conquerors. They had occupied with their own tribesmen part of the Aeduan land along their frontier, which they had seized in war, and indeed had established their hegemony over the whole of Gaul. It was to deal with this desperate situation that Diviciacus had made the journey to Rome to ask help from the Senate. He had returned again to his tribe without having achieved anything. With my arrival in Gaul, however, the situation changed. The Aedui had their hostages given back to them and their former dependencies restored. I even helped them to acquire control over states which they had not controlled before. This was because those who joined in alliance with them found that they were better treated and better governed than they had been previously. In other ways, too, the Aedui were given more influence and greater prestige. 
The Sequani lost the supreme power which they had exercised, and their place was taken by the Raimi. As it was known that the Raimi were as much in my favor as the Aedui, all those states which, because of old feuds, could never be induced to throw in their lot with the Aedui, now began to come into the sphere of influence of the Raimi, who took good care of them, and thus were able to retain this new and very rapidly acquired authority of theirs. At the time of which I am writing, the Aedui were acknowledged to be much the most important state in Gaul, with the Raimi occupying second place. Throughout Gaul there are only two classes of men whom we considered of any real importance. The common people, regarded virtually as slaves, never venture to act on their own initiative, and are never consulted about anything. Most of them, crushed down by debt, heavy taxation, or the oppression of more powerful men, enter the service of the nobles, who exercise over them the same rights as masters have over slaves. The two privileged classes are the Druids and the Knights. The Druids are in charge of religion. They are responsible for all sacrifices, public and private, and they decide all questions of ritual. Great numbers of young men come to them for instruction, and the Druids are very greatly honored by their pupils. It is the Druids, in fact, who are the judges in nearly all disputes, whether between tribes or between individuals. In every case of crime or murder or question of a disputed legacy or boundary, they are the people who give the verdict and assess the damages to be paid or received. Any individual or community failing to abide by their verdict is banned from the sacrifices and this is regarded as the worst punishment that one can have. Those who are excommunicated in this way are counted as criminals and evildoers. No one will come near them. People will neither meet them nor speak with them for fear of contracting some guilty infection from any kind of contact. If they ask for justice, they do not get it, and they are debarred from any position of distinction. One druid is at the head of all the rest, and has supreme authority over them. On his death he is succeeded by whatever druid is most honored among the others. If there are more than one of equal dignity, the succession is determined by a vote of the druids, though sometimes they actually go to war for the leadership. Each year, on a fixed date, they hold an assembly on consecrated ground in the territory of the Carnutes whose land is supposed to be in the very center of the whole country of Gaul. Those who have disputes to settle come from all over Gaul to this assembly, and accept the verdicts and rulings given to them by the Druids. It is thought that the Druidical doctrine was discovered already in existence in Britain, and was brought from there to Gaul. Even today it is the rule for those who want to become really expert in the doctrine to go to Britain and learn it there. The Druids are exempt from military service and do not pay taxes like the rest. These important privileges attract a great number of students, some of whom come of their own accord to be taught, while others are sent by their parents or relatives. During their training they are said to learn a great number of verses by heart, so many, in fact, that some people spend twenty years over their course of instruction. They do not think it right to commit these doctrines of theirs to writing, though for most other purposes, public and private accounts, for example, they use the Greek alphabet. I should imagine, however, that they had two other reasons for this practice. They did not want their teaching to become available to everyone, and they did not want those who learned their doctrine to rely on the written word, and so failed to train their memories. For it is usually the case that when we have the help of books, we are not so keen on learning things by heart, and allow our memories to become idle. They lay particular stress on their belief that the soul does not perish, but passes, after death, from one body to another and they consider that this belief is the best possible encouragement to courage, since it does away with the fear of death. 
They also hold long discussions about the heavenly bodies and their movements, the size of the universe and of the earth, the physical principles of nature and the power and properties of the immortal gods. And on all these subjects they instruct the young men who are their pupils. The second class is that of the knights. Whenever they are required for service in any war that has broken out, and intertribal wars, either aggressive or defensive, used to break out almost every year before my arrival in Gaul, they all serve on the campaign. Each one is attended by his own band of fighters and armed retainers, and the more of these that he has, the more noble and rich he is esteemed to be. Indeed, this is the only criterion they have of a man's position and influence. The Gauls, as a nation, are extremely superstitious. As a result, people who are seriously ill or who have to face the dangers of battle will either make or promise to make human sacrifices, employing the Druids as officiating ministers at these rites. They believe that the divine majesty can only be appeased if one human life is offered in exchange for another, and they have sacrifices of this kind established as a regular state institution. Some of them make use of enormous wickerwork images, the limbs of which are filled with living men. They are set alight, and the men perish in the flames. They believe that the gods prefer the execution of men who have been caught in the act of theft or armed robbery or some other crime. But if there are not enough of such criminals available, they will make up the number by sacrificing men who are perfectly innocent. The god most worshipped by them is Mercury, and very many images of him are to be seen. They regard him as the inventor of all the arts, the guide on every road and on every journey, and the god who has most power in connection with money-making and commercial undertakings. After Mercury, they chiefly worship Apollo, Mars, Jupiter, and Minerva, and hold roughly the same opinions about them as do other nations. That Apollo averts diseases. Minerva gives us the first principles of all sorts of craftsmanship. Jupiter holds power over the heavens, and Mars controls war. When they have decided to fight a decisive battle, they generally dedicate to Mars all the spoils which they hope to win, and after a victory they sacrifice the captured animals and bring all the rest of the captured property together in one place. In many states, one can see great piles of these objects lying in consecrated ground, and it has scarcely ever been known to happen that anyone will dare to go against the injunctions of religion and either hide his booty in his own house or remove any of the things that have been consecrated. The punishment established for such a crime is death under the most severe torture. The Gauls claim to be all descended from Father Dis, and say that this is a tradition that has been handed down to them by the Druids. For this reason, they measure periods of time by nights instead of by days, and in keeping birthdays or reckoning the first of the month or the beginning of the year, they go on the principle that the night comes first and the day follows it. In the ordinary customs of life, one of the chief differences between them and other people is that they do not allow their sons to approach them in public until the youths have reached the age for military service. They consider it a shocking thing if a son who is still in his boyhood stands in a public place where his father can see him. When he marries, a man contributes from his own property a sum equivalent in value to what he has received from his wife by way of dowry. A joint account is kept of the total, and the profits are set aside. Whichever of the two lives longer receives both portions together with the profits that have accumulated over the years. Husbands have the power of life and death over their wives as well as over their children. When the head of any noble family dies, 
His relatives meet together, and if there is anything suspicious about the way he died, they examine his wives under torture, as we do in the case of slaves. If guilt is proved, the punishment is a slow and very painful death. Considering the fairly low standard of living in Gaul, funerals are splendid affairs and cost a lot of money. They cast onto the funeral pyre everything that the dead man is supposed to have been fond of, including animals. And not long ago, slaves and dependents who were known to have been particular favorites of their masters were burned with them at the end of the funeral ceremony. Those states that have the reputation of running their affairs most efficiently have laid down a law by which anyone who hears from a neighboring state any news or rumor which concerns his own country is to report it to a magistrate without speaking of it to anyone else. This is because experience has shown that false rumors often have a disturbing effect on ignorant and unbalanced minds, driving people into criminal actions or leading them to interfere with important matters of policy. The magistrates suppress whatever news they think fit and only tell the public what they think is good for them to know. No one is allowed to discuss politics except in a public assembly. The German way of life is quite different from that of the Gauls. They have no druids to lead them in matters of religion, and they do not take much trouble about sacrifices. The only gods they recognize are visible objects with obviously beneficial effects, such as the sun, the moon, and fire. They have not even heard of any other gods. Their whole life is spent in hunting or in military pursuits, and from their earliest years they train themselves to endure toil and hardship. Those who retain their chastity longest are most highly honored among their fellows, because the Germans believe that continence makes a man grow taller and stronger and increases his muscular development. It is considered absolutely disgraceful in anyone under twenty to have had intercourse with a woman. Nevertheless, there is no secrecy about the facts of sex. Men and women bathe together in the rivers, and they wear nothing except skins or short cloaks of reindeer hide, which leave most of the body bare. They do not go in much for agriculture, but live mostly on milk, cheese, and meat. No one possesses any definite portion of land which he can call his own property. Each year the magistrates and chiefs of the tribe allot a piece of land, using their own judgment as to its size and position, to clans or groups of kinsmen living together, and the following year they make the tenants move on to another holding. They give a number of reasons for this custom of theirs, for example, to prevent people from getting so attached to a particular spot that they will lose their enthusiasm for war and take up agriculture instead. To check any desire for large estates, which would result in the strong driving the weak off their land. To discourage the building of houses, specially designed to protect the inmates from heat or cold. To prevent people from becoming fond of money, a vice which tends to lead to division and party strife and to keep the common people happy and contented by letting each man see that he himself is just as well off as the most powerful people in the tribe. What makes a German tribe particularly proud of itself is to live in the middle of a wilderness with as much land as possible beyond its frontiers, waste and derelict. They think it is the real mark of being a great and powerful nation to be able to force their neighbors off their land so that no one dares settle near them. And at the same time, they regard themselves as being more secure this way, since there will be no risk of any sudden invasion. Whenever a tribe is involved in any war, offensive or defensive, Supreme commanders are chosen and are given the power of life and death over their fellow tribesmen. In peacetime there are no magistrates with general powers. The chiefs of various districts and the leaders of clans administer justice and settle disputes among their own people. There is no disgrace in committing acts of brigandage, so long as these are done outside the frontiers of the tribe. Indeed, this is regarded as good training for the young men, 
and something which will prevent them from getting lazy. When one of their chiefs gets up in an assembly to say he will lead a raiding party and asks for volunteers to come with him, those who like the idea and approve of the leader rise to their feet and, amid general applause, promise him their help. If any of these fail to follow him in the end, they are regarded as traitors and deserters and will never be trusted again in anything. They think it wrong to commit any violence against a guest. Anyone who comes to a house of theirs for whatever reason is safe from injury and treated as sacrosanct. He can go to any man's home he likes and will receive his share of food there. There was a time in the past when the Gauls were a more warlike race than the Germans. They actually invaded Germany and settled colonies beyond the Rhine because their own population was too large for the land available to them. In this way, the Volki Tectusagis seized and occupied the most fertile district of Germany. This is the part near the Hercynian Forest, which I see Eratosthenes and other Greeks had heard about and called the Orcinian Forest. The Volki Tectusagis still maintain themselves as a nation in this area and have a very high reputation for good government and for military ability. At the present time, since their living conditions of want, poverty, and hardships are the same as those of the Germans, they eat the same kind of food and live in the German way. The Gauls, on the other hand, living near our province and acquainted with goods that come to them from overseas, are well supplied with both necessities and luxuries. They have gradually become used to defeat, and after fighting and losing so many battles, they do not even pretend to be the equals of the Germans in war. The Hakinian forest, which has just been mentioned, extends so far that a man traveling light would take nine days to cross it. This is the only way they have of describing it, since the Germans have no words for the measurements of distances. The forest begins on the frontiers of the Helveti, the Nemetis, and the Rauraki, and runs right along the bank of the Danube to the country of the Daki and the Anatis. At this point it turns away from the river in a northeasterly direction. As it is of such an enormous extent, it touches the countries of a number of different peoples. Indeed, one cannot find anyone in that part of Germany which we know who would claim to have reached the eastern end of this forest even after traveling for sixty days in that direction. Nor has anyone learned where it begins. It is known that there are to be found in this forest many kinds of wild animals which are not to be seen elsewhere. Some of these seem to be worth mentioning, since they are remarkably different from the animals one finds in the rest of the world. There is, for example, an ox shaped like a deer, which has a single horn projecting from the middle of its forehead between its ears. This horn is straighter and sticks up higher than those of the animals we know, and at the top it spreads out in branches like the branches of a tree or like the palms of a man's hands. The male and female of this species are alike, each having horns of the same shape and size. There are also animals which are called elks. They are like goats in shape and have the same kind of dappled skins, but they are rather bigger than goats and have horns that are only stumps. Their legs have no joints or articulations, and they never lie down to rest. If they fall down by accident, they are unable to get up again from the ground. They use trees as a means for getting repose. They lean against the trunks and so rest supported in this way. Hunters who track the elks to the place where they usually go to rest undermine the roots of all the trees in the neighborhood, or cut the trunks nearly through, so that, though they look solid, they are really on the point of falling. When the elks lean upon the trees in their usual way, they are too heavy for the weakened trunks, which collapse, and take the animals down with them. A third species is called the aurochs. This animal is rather smaller than the elephant and looks like a bull in color and shape. They are very strong and very fast on their feet, and they will attack any man or beast they catch sight of. 
It is a great thing among the Germans to capture these animals in pits and then kill them. This is a sport that involves hard work and provides good training for the young men. Those who have killed the largest numbers of these animals produce the horns in a public place as evidence of what they have done, and win great praise for their achievements. Even when caught quite young, these animals can never be tamed or domesticated. Their horns are much bigger than those of our oxen, and of a quite different shape and appearance. They are much sought after by the Germans, who put silver round their rims and use them for drinking cups at their grandest banquets. Pursuit of Ambiorix After the Ubian scouts had told me that the Suebi had retired into their forests, I decided not to advance any farther. I was afraid that we might run short of grain, since the Germans as a whole, as I have just explained, pay very little attention to agriculture. However, I did not want the natives to feel that they need have no further fear of us, nor did I want their reinforcements to get together too quickly. So, after withdrawing the army, I broke down two hundred feet of the bridge from the point where it touched the Ubian bank of the Rhine, and at the other end constructed a tower four stories high, with strong defense works all around it. To protect this position and the bridge, I left behind twelve cohorts under the command of young Gaius Volcatius Tullus. As soon as the crops began to ripen, I set out myself on the campaign against Ambiorix, marching through the forest of the Ardennes, which is the largest forest in Gaul. It extends from the Rhenish frontier of the Treveri to the Nervian frontier, and is more than five hundred miles long. I sent Lucius Minucius Basilus with all the cavalry in front of the main army, hoping that by advancing quickly, he might get a chance of doing something valuable. I ordered him not to allow any fires in his camp, so that the enemy could not get warning of his approach while he was still far off, and told him that I should be following him directly. Basilus carried out these instructions and completed his march much more quickly than most people thought possible. He took the natives by surprise, captured a number of them in the fields, and, acting on information received from them, made directly for Ambiorix himself in the place where he was reported to be with only a small cavalry escort. In war, as in everything else, fortune plays a very great part. Basilus was extremely lucky in catching Ambiorix completely off his guard and unprepared. Indeed, he appeared on the scene before there was the slightest rumor that he was on his way. But it was by an extremely great stroke of luck that Ambiorix himself escaped with his life, after losing all the military equipment he had with him, including his carriages and his horses. Yet this was what happened. The house where he stayed was in the middle of a wood, as is usual among the Gauls, who generally build their houses near woods and streams in order to avoid the heat. Fighting in a confined space, his friends and followers managed for a short time to hold up the attack of our cavalry. While this fighting was in progress, one of Ambiorix's men mounted him on a horse, and he escaped under cover of the woods. So, by pure luck, he was, first of all, brought into danger, and then liberated from it. It is difficult to be sure why it was that Ambiorix had not mobilized his army. It may have been part of his policy, taken in the belief that it would be unwise for him to fight a general engagement, or he may simply not have had time, being surprised by the sudden appearance of our cavalry, and believing that the main army was not far behind. In any case, he now sent messengers in all directions through the country with orders that every man was to shift for himself. Some of them fled into the forest of the Ardennes, others into the long, continuous stretches of marshland. Those who lived nearest the sea hid in places that are cut off from the mainland at high tide. Many emigrated from their own country, entrusting themselves and their property to the mercy of utter strangers. Catuvolcus, who was the king of one half of the Iberones, and who had joined with Ambiorix in the plot against us, was now weak with age, 
and unable to endure the hardships either of war or flight. After calling down every sort of curse on the head of Ambiorix, who had been the author of the plan, he poisoned himself by drinking the juice of a yew, a tree which is very common both in Gaul and Germany. The Isegni and Condrusi, two Germanic tribes who lived between the Iburones and the Treveri, now sent a deputation to me, begging me not to consider them as enemies, and not to assume that all Germans on the Gallic side of the Rhine had made common cause against me. They assured me that they had never had any idea of attacking us, and that they had sent no help to Ambiorix. I checked these statements of theirs by interrogating prisoners, and then ordered them to send me any fugitives of the Iberones who had taken refuge in their country. I promised that if they would do this, I would do no harm to their land. I then divided the army into three divisions, and took all the heavy equipment to Aduatuka, which is the name of the fortress, roughly in the middle of the country of the Iberones, where Sabinus and Cotta had had their winter quarters. I had several reasons for choosing this position, among which was the fact that last year's fortifications were still intact so that the troops would not have so much work to do. To guard the equipment, I left the 14th Legion, one of the three recently formed legions which I had brought from Italy. I put Quintus Tullius Cicero in command of the legion and the camp, and left him 200 cavalry as well. After dividing the army, I ordered Labienus with three legions to march toward the coast into the country on the frontiers of the Monopi. I sent Trebonius, also with three legions, to devastate the country on the frontiers of the Aduatuki, and I took the remaining three legions myself, my plan being to march to the river Scheldt, which flows into the Meuse, and to the western fringe of the Ardennes, where I had heard that Ambiorix had gone with a small escort of cavalry. Before leaving, I promised that I would be back again in a week, on the day that I knew the next issue of grain was due to the men in the legion that had been left behind to guard the baggage. I asked Lavienus and Trebonius to come back also on that date, if the military position permitted. This would give them an opportunity for a further discussion and examination of the enemy's tactics, after which they could resume the campaign. There was, as already explained, no regular enemy force to contend with, no stronghold, and no garrison that would put up any resistance. The whole population had scattered in every direction, and individuals would settle wherever a remote valley, a hideout in the woods, or a piece of difficult marshland offered any hope of defense and security. These hiding places were known to the people living round about, and great care was necessary to ensure the safety of our troops. Not that the army as a whole was in any danger, for as long as our men kept together, nothing was to be feared from an enemy who was both panic-stricken and scattered. The problem, rather, was to provide for the safety of individual soldiers, and though this, of course, was also a consideration that affected to some extent the security of the whole army and in their desire to get plunder, individual soldiers were very apt to get drawn too far away from the main body. Also, it was impossible for men in close order to advance along the narrow and overgrown tracks through the forest. I saw that if I wanted to finish the job off properly and utterly exterminate the whole tribe of criminals— I should have to divide the troops into a number of detachments and send them out in different directions, operating at some distance from each other. If, on the other hand, I preferred to keep the companies in regular formation according to usual Roman military practice, then the very nature of the ground served as a protection to the enemy, among whom were many individuals quite daring enough to lay ambushes for and surround any of our men who lost touch with the main body. Bearing all these difficulties in mind, I took every precaution that possibly could be taken. The troops were all on fire with the desire for revenge, 
yet even so I preferred to miss the chance of injuring the enemy rather than to do them harm at the expense of losing some of my own men. I sent messengers to all the neighboring states, inviting them, by holding out the prospect of plunder, to join in pillaging the Iburones. My object was to let Gauls, rather than Roman legionaries, risk their lives in the forests. At the same time, I wanted, by bringing huge forces against the Iburones from all sides, to wipe this tribe off the face of the earth as a punishment for the crime it had committed. Great numbers of Gauls came in from all sides in answer to my appeal. So every part of the country of the Iburones was being devastated, and by now the week was nearly up, and the day approaching on which I had decided to return to the legion which was guarding the baggage. Here again there occurred a good example of how important a factor in warfare is luck, and what consequences can follow from a pure accident. As already explained, the enemy were both panic-stricken and scattered. There was no body of troops that could cause us the slightest alarm. But the news spread to the Germans across the Rhine that the Iberones were being plundered, and that everyone else had been invited to join in. At once, a force of two thousand cavalry was raised by the Sugambri, who lived close to the Rhine, and who, as already mentioned, had received the fugitives from the Tincteri and the Eusipides. About thirty miles below the place where our bridge had been built and where I had left the garrison, these Sugambri crossed the river by means of boats and rafts and invaded the country of the Iburones. Here they captured a number of the tribesmen who were scattered in flight and also seized large herds of cattle, booty which is very much sought after by these savages. Hoping for still more plunder, they advanced farther. Born and bred as they were for war and brigandage, they were not to be stopped by marshes or by forests. From their prisoners they inquired where I was, and discovered that I had set off to some remote part of the country, and that the whole army had left the district. Then one of their prisoners said, Why go after the wretched, miserable booty that is available here, when you are in the position to make yourselves really rich? In three hours you could be at Aduatuca, where the whole baggage of the Roman army is collected. The garrison is so small that it cannot even man the rampart, and no one dares to take a step outside the fortifications. The Germans were delighted at the prospect. After hiding the plunder they had got already, they set out for Aduatuca, guided by the man who had given them the information. Every day up to now, Cicero had followed my instructions, and had been most careful to see that all the troops were kept in camp, not even allowing a single sutler to go outside the fortifications. But by the end of the week, he began to doubt whether I would come back on the exact day that I had promised. He had heard that I had gone a considerable distance away, and there was no sort of news about my return. He was also influenced by the way the soldiers were complaining. This strict procedure of his, by which no one was allowed to leave camp, was, they said, just as bad as an enemy blockade. He knew, too, that we had nine legions and a large force of cavalry in the field, and that the enemy was scattered and practically annihilated. It did not therefore seem at all likely that anything serious could happen within three miles of his camp. So he sent out five cohorts to get grain from the nearest fields. There was just one hill between these fields and the camp. With the cohorts, but as a separate detachment, went about three hundred of the soldiers who had been left behind in camp, because they were ill, but who had recovered in the course of the week. A large number of sutlers were also given leave to accompany the party, taking with them many of the pack animals that were being kept in camp. It happened that the German cavalry came upon the scene just at this very moment. Without pausing or slackening speed, they rode straight up to the camp and tried to break in by the back gate. On that side there were woods in the way, so that the Germans got quite close before they were seen. 
Indeed, the traders who were in their tents just underneath the rampart had no time to get away. The suddenness of the thing took our men completely by surprise, and caused considerable confusion, so much so that the cohort on guard was very nearly overwhelmed by the first attack. The enemy then swept around the other sides of the camp, trying to find a way in. Our troops succeeded with difficulty in holding the gates. Elsewhere, the nature of the ground and the fortifications themselves barred the enemy's way. There was panic all through the camp. Each man was asking the next what this disturbance was all about. No one knew where to fall in or where to go. Some said that the camp was already captured. Others declared that these natives had arrived after winning a great victory in which our army and its commander-in-chief had been destroyed. Nearly everyone allowed his imagination to be affected by superstitions arising from the place itself. They saw, as it were, before their eyes, the fate of Cotta and Sabinus, who had fallen in this very fortress. With everybody so much in the grip of a general panic, the natives became all the more inclined to believe what the prisoner had told them, namely, that the camp had no garrison to defend it. They struggled hard to force their way in, shouting out to each other not to let such a bit of luck slip through their hands. Among the sick men left behind with the garrison was Publius Sextius Baculus, who had served under me as chief centurion of his legion. I have already mentioned his conduct in earlier actions. Baculus had now been five days without food. Feeling very apprehensive about both his own and his comrades' safety, he came out of his tent unarmed and soon saw that the enemy were almost breaking in and the situation was about as dangerous as it could get. Snatching arms from the man nearest him, he took his stand right in the gateway, and was joined by the centurions of the cohort on guard. So, all fighting shoulder to shoulder, they bore the brunt of the battle for a while. Baculus was severely wounded and fainted, but passing him back from one man to another, they managed to save him. This respite, however, gave the others a chance to pull themselves together, to stand in their proper positions on the fortifications, and at least to look as though they were defending the place. Meanwhile, our troops, who had gone to get grain and had by now finished their work, heard the noise of shouting from the camp. The cavalry hurried ahead and discovered how dangerous the position was. The men were terrified. Unlike the others, they had no fortifications to shelter them. Raw recruits, quite inexperienced in warfare, they simply turned their eyes toward their officers and centurions, waiting to be told what to do. Everything had happened so suddenly that even the bravest was thrown off his balance. The Germans, seeing the standards and the distance, broke off their attack on the camp. They thought at first that it was our legions returning from the expedition, which, according to the information of the prisoners, should have taken us further afield. But soon they saw how few troops there were, and, despising the small number, charged down upon us from every side. The sutlers rushed forward to the nearest bit of high ground and were dislodged from it almost immediately. They then ran back to where the men were forming up in their companies, thus increasing the alarm that the soldiers felt already. Some of our troops were in favor of adopting a wedge formation with the idea of breaking through quickly to the camp, which, as they pointed out, was not far off. Even if some were surrounded and killed, they felt sure the rest would be able to get through safely. Others were for taking up a defensive position on the ridge, where they could all face the same chance together. The detachment of veterans, who, as already stated, had gone out with the rest, were against this second plan. They shouted out words of encouragement to each other, and then, led by their commander, Gaius Trebonius, a Roman knight, cut their way right through the middle of the enemy and got into camp without losing a single man. In the wake of their charge came the sutlers and the cavalry, who owed their safety to the good fight that had been put up by the veterans. But the others, who had taken up their position on the ridge, showed themselves still totally ignorant of the science of war. 
They could neither stick to their original plan of defending themselves on the high ground, nor imitate the speed and vigor which, as they had seen, had stood their comrades in such good stead. They did, indeed, attempt to get back to camp, but in doing so they came downhill and got themselves caught in an unfavorable position. The centurions, some of whom had been promoted for gallantry from the lower grades of other legions to the higher grades in this one, were not going to lose the glory which they had already won in war, and fought on most gallantly to the last. It was owing to their courage that the enemy were forced back a little. Some of our men, much to their own surprise, got into camp safely. The rest were surrounded and killed by the natives. Seeing that our men were in position along the fortifications, the Germans now gave up all hope of storming the camp and retired across the Rhine, taking with them the booty which they had hidden in the woods. Even after they had gone, the panic among our men remained so great that when Gaius Volusinus, whom I had sent ahead with the cavalry, arrived in camp that night, he could not make them believe that I was near with the whole army, safe and sound. The men in the camp were so totally terror-struck that they were practically out of their wits. The whole army had been destroyed, they said, and only the cavalry had escaped from the rout. They insisted that if the army were really in existence, the Germans would never have attacked the camp. The panic ended when I arrived. Personally, I was not without experience of the way things happen in war, and when I reached the camp, the only complaint I had to make was that the cohorts had been sent out of camp and away from their posts in the garrison. In my view, nothing at all should have been left to chance, and I was able to remark how powerful a part had been played by fortune. It was purely by chance that the enemy had arrived so suddenly, and it was even more a matter of luck that they had diverted their attention elsewhere, when the rampart and gates were practically in their hands. Perhaps the strangest thing of all was that the Germans, who had crossed the Rhine, determined to ravage the lands of Ambiorix, by making this descent on our camp actually did Ambiorix as great a service as he could possibly have desired. I now set out on another expedition to devastate the country of the Iburones. Large forces had been raised from neighboring states and were sent out in all directions, Every village and every building they saw was set on fire. Cattle from every part were driven in as booty. The grain, much of which had in any case been flattened by the rains, was consumed by the huge numbers of men and animals engaged in the operation, so that it seemed evident that even if some of the local inhabitants had managed to hide themselves for the time being, they would die of starvation after the troops had withdrawn and with such a large force of cavalry scouring the country in every direction, it often happened that we took prisoners who a moment before had seen Ambiorix in flight, who would turn their heads to look after him and insist that he could not really be out of sight. With such hopes of catching up with him, his pursuers, thinking of the gratitude they would earn from me, took enormous trouble and made almost superhuman efforts. Always, however, they seemed just to have missed the final and crowning success. And the oryx would manage to steal away to the shelter of some wooded glen, and then, under cover of night, would make off in some different direction, or toward some other country. He never had more than four horsemen with him, and these were the only men to whom he dared entrust his life. After the whole area had been devastated, as described, I withdrew the army, which had suffered the loss of two cohorts, to Durocorturum, a city of the Remi. Here I summoned a council of the Gauls and held an inquiry into the conspiracy of the Senones and Carnutes. Akko, the leader of the conspiracy, was sentenced with a particular severity, being flogged to death in the old Roman manner. Some, fearing the result of the inquiry, took to flight, and were declared outlaws. I then arranged for the distribution of the legions in winter camps. Two were left on the frontier of the Treveri, two among the Lingones, 
and the other six at Agedinkum, in the country of the Sinones. After making sure that their grain supply was secure, I set out as usual for northern Italy to hold the Assizes. <laughs>